Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado. What's up, Beijing? Welcome to What's Up, Beijing. Thank you, Xi Jinping, for that intro. This is the section of the show where we talk about the goings and comings in the world of China and United States relations, which has been the top story of the past week. As you may recall, Xi Jinping spent the past few days in San Francisco talking with Joe Biden and attempting on both sides to heal the divide that has sprung up between the two countries to become friends again. Look at this cute picture. They've rediscovered the joy of talking. <laughs> the goal is to get these two gigantic economic and military powers on friendlier terms because their escalating rivalry is causing issues. They had a couple days of pretty productive talks, which unfortunately ended with Joe Biden calling Xi Jinping a dictator again which was one of the things that kicked off this escalation back in July. Now, <laughs> you might be right, but it's not the greatest thing to do after the talk. And what was really funny to me, what cracked me up, is seeing Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, they had a they had a reverse cam on his face as Joe Biden said it. Take a look at his face. He spent, again, this is our Secretary of State, so we spent a lot of time setting up this meeting and trying to get China and the United States to come to the table. Just hearing the question, look at his eyes, they become nervous. After today, would you still refer to President Xi as a dictator? <laughs> <laughs> Bro, the second he said he is, just, oh, oh, that's gonna be such a headache for the next few months. So that caused some trouble. However, it turns out that this one statement, while this might've caused a lot of China-American tension back in July, was actually able to be kind of brushed aside this time. China did make a response. <laughs> this kind of statement is extremely incorrect and irresponsible manipulation. It needs to be pointed out that there has always been people with ill intentions <laughs> who try to sow discord and undermine China-US relations, and this will not succeed. <laughs> but it's funny because they say it like it was some random person getting in the way of Biden and Xi's friendship, but it is Biden who said it. <laughs> <laughs> but that was it. That was the only statement. It was actually really small, and they kind of brushed right past it. And in fact, soon after, guess what? The pandas are coming back to America. No, China didn't take back the pandas. In fact, Xi Jinping is hinting that China could send new pandas back to the United States as envoys of friendship. This is serious. Recently, we reported on Was It Beijing that China has recalled all of their pandas from US zoos and they've been shipped home. But now, is hinting that new ones could come back. Generally, over the past, I mean, you guys know it from the Western side, I've talked about this. A lot of YouTubers, uh, Western media, because it gets clicks, whether or not they even care politically, will post a lot of the most negative news out of China. Even if some of it's true, it's just it, they're choosing only one side of it and posting it again and again. What turns out, the same thing kind of happens in reverse in China. China, for the past few years, especially you can tell from the Global Times, has been making a killing, <laughs> uh, posting an endless stream of conventional and social media coverage of like, shootings, banking sector woes, train derailments. <laughs> if there's bad news in America, it sells in China. If there's bad news in China, it sells in America, all right? Turns out both sides are pretty guilty of this. So this has been going back and forth. And generally, this has been what's been printed. However, Chinese state media, in anticipation of this upcoming trip by Xi Jinping to America, has been taking a softer tone. And in fact, has been pushing a lot of stories about the flying tigers, which is a historical time America and China fought together against Japan. American pilots went to China and served in a volunteer air force to fight against Japan called the Flying Tiger. And it was kind of like the last time uh, American pilots and Chinese pilots flew side by side and helped each other. And it's like a big story in China of like US and China being able to cooperate. Uh, these are some actual still alive flying tigers. China and US relations need a new generation of flying tigers, said Xi Jinping in this letter that he wrote to these actual guys to try and get them to do a ceremony, which they did. And what's really funny to me is I read about this story that this was happening, like this was like blowing up in China. And I was like, uh, in my meeting with our Marketing Monday team, we were talking about possible stories for the week. And I was like, have you heard anything about like these, you know, China's pushing this little flying tigers thing to try and soften the stance on America. And she tells me, Stefik, <laughs> that her dad earlier that day knew she worked for a YouTuber and had sent her that story saying, wonder if the YouTuber you work for knows about the flying tigers. Her dad who lives in China, <laughs> which is really fucking funny. So like it is spreading around. The real point though, I'm sorry, of Xi Jinping's trip is not about the flying tigers and it's not about pandas and it's not about whether or not Biden calls military. Like I mentioned, the real point was this, meeting business leaders to increase foreign direct investment back in China. And they welcomed Xi Jinping with a standing ovation. Elon Musk, he bought, he was in for it. May there be prosperity for all as he gave Xi Jinping a shake. The whole point was to say, hey, you know what? All this tension is down. You can come back, you can invest, you can build in China. 
things are good. The real winner of the entire event, not Biden, okay, not Elon Musk, was Xi Jinping and, and all of us because we finally got to see this smile. <laughs> this is the biggest smile I've ever seen Xi Jinping give because Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, gave him a custom Warriors jersey. <laughs> I mean, he is cheesing, dude. This might have actually healed the divide more than anything else. We might actually have a friendship here. This is only the intro to our top was a Beijing story of the week, which is about something back in China. This is the big story that we've had our uh, investigative reporter, Stefik, look into on Chinese social media. And that is, there is now a coordinated effort to dox every content creator in China <laughs> above a certain follower size. That effort is by the government. <laughs> it's just a law. Let me give you a little bit of background on what I'm saying. Pre-2017, if you were an online content creator in China or someone that had any amount of followers, you were allowed to be anonymous. If you wanted to have a name like, I don't know, Zoo Share or Drop Spindle or Joey Grips or Novin Prime, you could do that. You could just be whoever you wanted online and you could post about it and you didn't have to have any connection to your real life. Who wants to be anonymous online? I do, said everyone in China. That sounds great. Then in September 2017, China started to add real name registration laws forbidding anonymous online posts. What that means is when you sign up for an account, you must use your real ID and your real name, but only in the back end. Now, what that means is nobody else can see your real name except for the government and the, the owners of the companies, but nobody else, the public can't tell. You, you could still be technically anonymous, you know, to everybody else. It didn't cause very much outcry. There was a little bit of outcry, but not much. Then in April of last year, suddenly you now had a public display of your user location to combat quote, bad behavior, which means any post you make would be tagged with where you posted it from. And this is, you, is that something you turn off? Now it was only the region. So think of it like the state. If you posted from Alabama, it would tell you posted from Alabama. Uh, if you posted from America, they could see if you're posting from a foreign country. And that's kind of like one of the main points of this. Here's examples on actual social media. Thank you to Stephen for finding this. See, if you post from the USA, it'll tell you it's posted from the USA. If you're from Shanghai, it'll tell you, et cetera, et cetera. And also this displays your IP location. This part's the scarier part. Your IP location updates automatically whether or not you are posting. This is on your profile, which means let's say I make a post from Shanghai and then I fly to America, do not make a post. It can tell my followers that I am currently in America. <laughs> that is public knowledge that my IP is on my profile unchangeable. Now, as in right now, things are changing even more. The real name stuff that was on the back end previously is now going to be public to everybody if you're over 500,000 followers. Basically, if you are a big content creator, your real name and your live updated IP is now public to everybody. China's X-like service asks top influencers to show real names. And to call this an X-like service is an incredible compliment to Elon Musk and X and Twitter because they are way fucking smaller. <laughs> Every one of the Chinese social media platforms is dramatically bigger than X.com, still called Twitter on this chart. And so why are they doing this? Why are they, why even back in April did they decide to publish this information? There's multifaceted reasons, but the general idea, <laughs> this is the Weibo CEO who, who was the first one to pilot this program and show it on his own profile. People are concerned about regional discrimination, which is like, hey, think about it in American terms. If somebody posts something on Reddit that you disagree with and it says posted from Alabama, then instead of responding to what they say, you might just make an Alabama joke. <laughs> this is happening all over in Chinese social media where they can see what region you posted from and then whatever jokes about that region or whatever, people are doing that. There's regional discrimination. So people are kind of pissed on that alone. So, so somebody's asking the CEO, is this a problem? Regional discrimination is, is increased. And the CEO says there's no data on that, but there has been fewer rampant 1450 comments on mainland internet platforms. Now 1450, thank you to Stephen for translating, refers to people in Taiwan who use Chinese social media to talk shit about China. <laughs> and before you couldn't tell where they were posting from, but now it says posted from Taiwan. So everybody else can be like, well, fuck you, you're from Taiwan and shit on you, which is kind of the point. <laughs> the point is to try and stop people who can speak Chinese in Taiwan from posting freely on social media about, you know, anti-unification with China. That's like the main overarching goal 
of making this stuff public. Because I, I first didn't really understand why they would do this uh, if they had the information on the back end. But it's like to make the average person like threatened or turn off their brain or not not, not listen to this kind of stuff. And again, Stefik here is saying uh, in her report that essentially her opinion is that this is kind of like a threat. Because <laughs> I think any consecrator or anyone who watches consecrators knows the ability of people to know where you are <laughs> and your real name when you say something online will make you scared about what you say. <laughs> and if it's not a popular opinion and now you have to attach your real name to it is scary. And imagine if you're an anonymous account who is known for saying things that might be a little more risque or anti the actual hardcore party line of the government. Now you're very afraid to say those things because the public knows your location and your real name. They say they want to hold anonymous social media consecrators accountable for what they say. One opinion on the web is that large consecrators are getting a bit too influential and the higher ups don't like it. Essentially, the rise of massive social media influencers and streaming influencers in China allows people to have as much influence as um, government spokesmen. And that's a dangerous precedent. And so they don't like it. They want to make sure they have ability to crack down on them. So negative effects of this. I think this is like a pure bad policy that's going to have immediately apparent dangerous and negative effects. Even disregarding saying anything unpopular, they have this similar content creator culture in China where big creators have rabid fans. <laughs> and that alone is dangerous. That alone, the ability to dox and find people is fucking dangerous. Smaller content creators often have real jobs. And if you're able to look up somebody's name and their region, you can find out their real job very quickly. And if they say something you don't like or you want to like harass them, you can harass their job. There's a lot of risks. Evan Gao could show up at your office and do backflips way easier, <laughs> but it could be more dangerous than that. So that's already dangerous, okay? But the first and most obvious casualty of this rule is VTubers. VTubers have specifically chosen to be as anonymous as possible. To a VTuber, it is very important that, the, that, that their public, their audience does not know their real name. That is one of the benefits of VTubing, that that's the reason they choose that lifestyle. And now they're being forced, if they hit a certain size, to reveal their identities in order to stay monetized. If I want to keep going with this business that I've created, I have to publicly show my real name and occupation. I have three options. Either live like an open book and all of my fans can find me pretty easily, delete my follower count, some creators are doing this because on Weibo and WeChat and these Chinese social medias, you can actually delete followers. You can force someone to unfollow. And so people that had 15 million followers are deleting down to 500K in order to make sure that they don't uh, get their shit doxxed. Or you can just delete your account altogether. Here's a VTuber who's smaller, hasn't encountered the problem yet, but they are saying the policy is an invasion of her privacy. She has a day job and does not want to share her online persona with people in her real life. She wants her VTuber life and her, on her real life to be separate. Now, she can't say this out loud. So she says that if this policy is applied to VTubers, she'll, and then apparently she start playing the happy birthday song <laughs> as a way of expressing that I'm really pissed about this, but can't say anything. <laughs> If you follow the trend line from like September 2017 to now, there's a continual erosion of the rights of creators to privacy. And so people that are under 500K are starting to realize that maybe eventually this is gonna roll out to 250K or 100K or everybody. Like it does not seem like they're gonna stop at 500K and just, it'll be okay. Even creators like this rapper named Kindergarten Killer, <laughs> which I, I hope translates better. <laughs> Kindergarten Killer, a popular Chinese rapper who has songs like, Red, which is incredibly pro-China, like he's not like anti-government in any way, has deleted his account in, in protest of this policy. Like he's a guy who's pro-government and he's actually extremely worried about his real life and real name getting leaked. And even on Chinese social media where stuff like this can be censored, a poll went up that had a drastic percentage of people voting, saying they were against the policy. 14,000 against, 4.8K approving. For example, this VTuber is saying X activate, meaning they're gonna try and get on a VPN and use fucking Elon Musk's Twitter. <laughs> I don't think they've got the the scale. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing a, a total crackdown on social media privacy in China. And I want to thank Stefik for being the one to really tell me and, and inform me on this uh, this update. And we'll keep following up on it. But that is our latest update on What's Up Beijing. Thanks for watching. And tune in for more news on marketing, business, and China in the future.